Okay, hello. Um, my name is Gary Tedman, and this video is about uh, Karl Marx's 1844 manuscript, <clears throat> which he wrote when he was a young man. Um, to get straight to the point, the interesting thing about this manuscript, apart from its subject matter and its content, is that it has a very unusual um, design. I'm talking about the manuscript and not the uh, not the published book, the original manuscripts that he wrote, he hand wrote. Now, Marx hand wrote this uh, in a landscape format, not not in the traditional notebook format, but in a hand in a landscape format. And he wrote it in columns, uh, sometimes three columns, sometimes two, sometimes one. The columns would change when certain concepts appeared or disappeared or were negated. Um, <clears throat> uh, also, the pagination. Uh, what's pagination? Pagination meaning you know page one, page two, page three, but the pagination in this doesn't follow a normal book or notebook sequence. Uh, you don't go and turn the page to page one to page two to page three to page four. You uh, specifically in notebook one, there are three. In notebook one, the page sequence is very unusual. It uh, requires you to look at three columns on the page and then turn the whole page, the whole manuscript around and flip over the page and then get to page two. And uh, to cut the long story short, uh, what this means is that by the time you've read through to the end, uh, you are back at the beginning of the text. Now, um, again, to get right to the point, the interesting thing about this, I think, is that uh, it's uh, quite deliberate. This makes it fairly obviously it's deliberate. Uh, it's it's not experimental, or it's it's not a it's not just a way of taking notes. Um, it might be both of those things, but also it's um, something he's consciously done, and it's part of the design of the book. So anyway, what has happened in the publication of this? Uh, it was published very late, anyway. Is that these things have been uh, not followed in the published books, mainly because it's very difficult and, um, you know, books have a traditional format. Now, the um, page samples that I've showed at the beginning of this video are uh, screenshots of a electronic book that I created, which tries to show the actual page layout in landscape. It's um, on Kindle, available on Kindle in the US, um, not in Europe for some reason, copyright reasons, I think. Um, this tries to show using the hypertext system and the ability to uh, on, it, on the electronic format to show three columns and to have an unusual pagination. It tries to be a facsimile, if you like, of uh, the original document and it's a translation into English. Um, and I think it's fairly faithful to the original design of the book, but without, without some obvious features of a physical document. I mean, the turning over the page and the turning around of the document can't be replicated um, very easily in this format. Um, I've written in the past an essay on this that was published in Rethinking Marxism. Um, and most of my own work on aesthetics also refers to this as a, um, an important sort of influence on it. Um, well, the 1844 manuscripts are important uh, for, for Marxism as a whole, and uh, it's a very important philosophical text, of course. Um, it was published quite late and translated even later. And uh, 
one of the interesting things about it is it's it, the the text that I use the the writer the translator who translated it um, was blind and I he's unfortunately not with us anymore but um, I spoke to a friend of his and uh, he said it might have been difficult for him to have access to the physical design of the document um, for obvious reasons but it's also difficult to have access to it anyway. The original manuscript is in the IISH in Holland, Institute of Social Research in Holland, something like that. And um, it took me a really long time to get photocopies. This is back in the 90s. I started this research in the late, in the early 1980s when I was a, an art student at Portsmouth Polytechnic Fine Art Department. And um, ever since then, I've been working on it. And in the 90s, I, I think it was the 90s, I, I actually, in the end, managed to get copies, photocopies of photocopies of the original documents, the original manuscript. And um, so I'm going to show you some of this next. OK, so what I'm going to try and show you now um, is uh, photocopies that I've received um, of Notebook 3, Manuscript 3 of the 1844 Economic and Philosophical Manuscript uh, by Karl Marx. And um, here it is. And they were sent to me. It was Notebook 3 that was sent to me. And um, what I did was I managed to... Um, take the photocopies which were only one sided the other side was blank and study the edges and the kind of errors in the photocopying and the ink blocks that Marx made and back them so that I create a, a page in its correct sequence. Um, Notebook 3 isn't so uh, so unusual in pagination as Notebook 1 or Manuscript 1. Um, I don't know why it might be that he wrote Notebook 3 first, the philosophical. Notebook 3 is philosophical, whereas Notebook 1 is more economics to do with Adam Smith, whereas Notebook 3 is to do with Hegel, mainly. So um, if I bend the screen down a bit on my laptop, you can see, hopefully, the page that I'm... This is, this is the document. Um, here you can see that the layout has the binding at the top and uh, there, are, there are some blank pages and then you have page one like so. Page two, is therefore like that. And then, is this page three? Oh yeah, page three, like that. You um, look, for instance, at this uh, page, you can see an ink blot. And uh, the ink blot is actually a smudge from the block that originally is on this page, I think. Um, there's the block. And uh, it actually goes through the page and kind of affects the writing on this page. So Marx kind of writes around it and has to deal with it. Um, so that's one way you can sort of work out pagination and what's going on. And you can see that a lot of this is in fact in um, two columns, not three columns. Unlike the first manuscript, which is mainly three columns, and changes to two columns for some of it, and uh, sometimes one. 
yeah, it's mainly coupons. Some of them are fatter and some of them are thinner. Um, it's like he's trying to make sure that certain concepts and things uh, end up side by side, or, which is amazing if you think about it. Um, one of the controversies or interesting things about Notebook 3 is the what I call the core notebook, which is often said to be on the subject of Hegel's concept of absolute knowledge. Um, this is where Marx criticizes Hegel, the philosopher Hegel, and he does it in a, he doesn't criticize that you can have knowledge, but he's, it is a criticism of, a very short criticism of the whole of Hegel's uh, sort of theory, idealist theory of knowledge, although he he doesn't reject the dialectic of it. Um, this is in the center of the uh, notebooks and it has an unusual form different to the rest. This is rather like the um, first notebook in which it has, it's said to have a core notebook, which is different to the outer sheets. Uh, this has a core notebook too, which is to do with Hegel's concept of absolute knowledge and Hegel's philosophy as a whole. Okay. Um, I can show you this. Uh, this is the core notebook of, of Manuscript 3. And we can see these pages like so. So that's uh, that one, and, also, and you can see that they kind of spread out from the center. Um, so this is written down like that in one big thing, and this is written down like that in one big column, like so. So um, this is page one of the core notebook. This is page two. And then there's page three. This is page three. Page four of it is the other way. And page four of it finishes like so. And then you can see the rest of the notebook three in two columns is around it. And this is right the center of the book, center of the notebooks, right in the center. So, uh, what does all this uh, mean? What does it mean? Well, that's where it gets sort of more complicated and you're not just talking about um, this physical document, um, historic document from 1844, written by Karl Marx, but you're talking about what he meant in the subject matter of the text and uh, the history of what that has meant. Um, in, in uh, politics, um, it's a lot. It's a long and involved subject. I'll tell you what I think uh, in as short a form as I can and as sim simply as I can. Um, generally, I think that by disregarding the form, uh, the original form of the manuscript, and turning it basically into a traditional form. Um, this, plus the fact that it, that gave the opportunity to put subject headings and arrange it in the way that they, that the editors and translators wanted to, um, this led to a sort of interpretation of the text which was slightly biased, although there are some 
you know, the, the translation that I know is, is, the English translation is excellent, I think. I have, don't have much of a problem with it. It's just that I think the arrangement, the rearrangement of the text and the slanting of the translation is a little bit humanist and very, as such, it's kind of conducive. It, it, it makes Western Marxism like it more in, in its humanist form. Um, what do I mean by humanism? Well, Marx is not a humanist philosopher. He's, he's a, a rational dialectical materialist. And uh, I think humanism really rejects the dialectical aspect of it in relation to materialism. It gets rid of that and it tries to paint that kind of Marx as if, it, as if he's Hegel and as if Hegel was a sort of maniac who wanted to take over the world as a dictator. Um, so Marx was not a humanist philosopher. He was a humanitarian, but he wasn't a humanist. Uh, it has a specific meaning in philosophy. Right, the humanist interpretation of in philosophy was helped by this uh, absence of the form in the 1844 manuscripts and some of the sort of poetic content of it lends itself to that, although I see it in a very different way. Uh, I see it rather like Dostoevsky is writing. It's, it's, it's it has that same sort of uh, materialist, poetic, uh, amazing dynamic to it. Um, it what, what interested me was that some late Marxists like Louis Althusser um, even accepted this interpretation, even though he's not a humanist Marxist. He's a very rational, dialectical, materialist writer who's interested in Freud and understands Freud. And yet he still thought of the 1844 manuscripts as a humanist text, which I really think it is not from, from my reading. Now, I wrote a book um, based on this, based, based in the fact that I started off uh, as a, an art student. This is how I came to studying this uh, when I was doing my thesis. In 1982, I, I wrote about it and I've been writing about it ever since. Um, one of the themes in the 1844 manuscripts is alienation. And, um, and I think uh, it has quite a lot, how could you put it? The fact that it, the form of the text has been sort of uh, ignored or even hidden a little bit, um, is an aesthetic issue and uh, aesthetic issues are materialist issues they're issues of materialism because aesthetics is to do with stuff material um, sensuality and um, so I became interested in the subject of aesthetics and alienation and that was continuous with um, trying to understand the 1844 manuscripts not just in terms of its subject matter and themes but in terms of it as a physical object. So my book was uh, Aesthetics and Alienation and uh, yeah that's a kind of advert isn't it but it's, it's not really it's just if you if you need to look back at any of this and want the information then it's there. Yeah the other person I should mention is uh, Margaret Fay who was a really great detective who unearthed um, many of these things about um, the 1844 manuscripts and particularly the first manuscript long before I did and um, her essay is on I think it's on uh, Adam Smith and the 1844 manuscripts and it was in Sci the journal um, Science and Society. Yeah well there's one more thing I kind of made a bit of a leap, I have to admit, it's a bit of a leap. But I thought that Marx, uh, this period in history was uh, 
doing something with the form that was kind of beginning to happen then in uh, art, which is um, the beginnings, glimmer, beginning glimmers of uh, modernism. And, uh, you know, uh, ways of treating the form in uh, poetry and um, art and visual art and painting, sculpture in a, what can we say, in a new way or non-traditional way, changing the form, um, the form of the book, if you like. Uh, that, incidentally, is a very good book by Jan Chisholm. I don't know the pronunciation correctly. It's a, uh, the form of the book is about the form of the book in history and uh, it's very interesting and it, it, it does uh, tell you about books and uh, the way they're designed and the history of the way they're designed which treats, uh, treats that subject very seriously and not to do with um, so much the content of the books but the design and the design in relation to the, then, then you can apply the design to the subject matter and see you can have a sort of secondary meaning well what's the meaning of the design the form um for instance um in the beginning of humanism it was more of a, a book form to uh, rid the book of or too much illustration and fancy fancy work and have very plain text and plain style of uh, presentation. Um, my kind of leap really was to think of Marx's uh, 1844 manuscripts, this strange design as being avant-garde, as being very much like uh, in a, a very early form of constructivism, rather like the constructivist avant-garde, like Malevich or Popov, uh, uh, yeah, Rachenko. It made me think of those artists, and of course, I have to admit I was biased because um, I was a, an art student and I was uh, following these artists in my in my own work. So that's um, that was a sort of uh, maybe it's a bit of a stretch to say that, but but I don't know if you think. Um, if you think of, Poly of uh, Apollinaire's uh, poem about the rain, about rain, and he writes it in lines of coming down, um, is that just experimental? It's no, it's a work of art. And he is deliberate. Would we say that Karl Marx can't do that? He's, he's not capable of that. No, that's silly. Did Marx ever intend this to be published in this format? I'm sure he thought that this is not going to be possible. He wanted to publish it. I don't know if he wanted it to be published in this format. I doubt if he thought it would be possible, but he kept this document with him throughout his life. And apparently it said that he would refer to it for self-clarification. Now that is very much like an artwork. You refer to an artwork for self-clarification in some way. It sort of confirms things for you. It, it's a referent. You can have a visual referent uh, yeah, in a painting. And you can refer to it, you go to it, you go to see it. It confirms you in your, your sort of aesthetic. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>